Food plays an important role in the spiritual lives of religious groups around the world. Since the beginning of time, dietary laws have been incorporated into the religious practices of people across all faiths and religions. Some religious groups abstain or are forbidden from consuming certain foods and drinks. Some restrict food and drinks during their holy days, while others associate dietary and food preparation practices with rituals of the faith, including fasting. To understand the reasons for nutritional and dietary customs in any religion requires a brief orientation of the rationale for such practices and laws. Many religious customs and laws may also be traced to early concerns for health and safety in consuming foods or liquids. In this documentary, we will discover the dietary laws in Christianity, halal and kosher foods in Islam and Judaism, being a Hindu vegetarian, veganism and ital food within the Rastafarian community. We will introduce you to A Taste of Heaven. The Seventh-day Adventist Church advocates a lacto-over-vegetarian diet. The Church's beliefs are grounded in the Bible and in a belief in the holistic nature of people. Well, the Adventist Church does um, go back to the original um, source, and that is the Bible, with regards to diet. In the Bible, we find three very distinct diets. In the first part, it was the ideal diet. And we find this in Genesis 1 verse 29, where the Lord says, eat the fruits of the trees and the seeds and the grains. So those things were our ideal diet. That's what God constituted for man to eat for, for the rest of eternity. Um, later he permitted uh, a permitted diet, and that included animal products. But it was under very, very strict um, conditions. Um, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 3, verse 17, no blood, no fat should be eaten. So any animal product that has that in it is something we should avoid. Um, and then it was an unpermitted diet. And if we look at Leviticus, the 11th chapter, it was very clear that, that some of the animal products that was given to man to eat was under strict conditions. They should be in good healthy um, state, um, it should be clean animals. There was a clear distinction between clean and unclean animals in the biblical times. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are very mindful of what we cook because we know that everything you take into your body has an effect on your spiritual life and the rest of your life as well in all other areas. And in 3 John 2, the Bible states that, Beloved, I wish above all things for you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So by that it means that God is also interested in us being healthy because He knows that we can just live so much better for Him. And of course we would also focus on many fresh, um, including fresh foods in our diets and also whole foods, nuts and seeds, etc. to make sure that we get a good variety. And of course when looking at fruit and vegetables, we'll make sure to get different colors and different textures into our bodies as well. And by that, we make sure that we live healthy. I think when we, 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 we talk about a healthy lifestyle, we talk about those things that would harm our body. So I would avoid those things that would harm my body. And any substance that would be a stimulant, that would change my mind, that would change my thoughts, that would be seen as something that is that is harmful to our bodies and we would encourage our members to avoid those drinks so alcoholic beverages smoking um, uh, food that would be unhealthy that would be important to avoid um, we think of um, the meat in the um, the diet that god has permitted and it was actually permitted only for a short time he said only healthy animals it was very clearly stated that it should be a clean animal. Um, these statements are really very important for health and longevity. God is our creator. He knows what's the best for us. And he does give us what we need from a day-to-day -day point. It's our choice. And uh, Seventh-day Adventism is not about you going to a hot place because you're not eating this or that way. It's about a choice. And... Uh, the quality of life and the longevity is just the fruits that we pick 
by, by this. We have found, and research has now shown, that Seventh-day Adventists live 10 to 12 years longer by this sort of diet. God is good, and we praise Him for that. The dietary practices of devout Roman Catholics center around the restriction of meat or fasting behaviors on specified holy days. Catholicism grows out of Judaism, and in Judaism the dietary laws are of tremendous importance. Unfortunately, they're not essential to the law or to the covenant relationship for which the law is given. When we get to Jesus, Jesus simply ignores initially the dietary laws and the laws about washing from fingertip to elbow before eating. His disciples do exactly the same because he does that. He's challenged by the Pharisees and the scribes and says it's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean, for whatever a person eats goes into the stomach and passes into the sewer. Mm -hmm and he therefore declares all foods clean. It's what comes into a man's heart and goes out of his heart that makes that person unclean. So for Jesus, unclean has got nothing to do with food and dietary laws, washing of hands and cups and pots. It's got everything to do with a converted, transformed heart. Unless the heart is converted, jealousy, anger, hatred, violence is what flows out of a person's heart. It's that that makes the person unclean. So specifically, dietary laws are not there. But there are issues around food um, in a spiritual sense. And that spiritual sense has to do firstly with fasting, and that takes on huge significance in the history of the church, um, and is still very much a relevant issue. And it's not just fasting so that I don't have a meal, but it's fasting for a particular aim, fasting for justice, fasting for truth, fasting for conversion, fasting for an end to violence and crime. So you direct that lack of food into something creative. It becomes a whole prayer and a way of spirituality. The significance of bread and wine comes from the Jewish Passover meal. And so when Jesus celebrates the Last Supper, he is simply celebrating Jewish Passover taking bread and wine. He tells his disciples, do this in memory of me. This is my body, this is my blood. Foundation of Eucharist, which is then realized through his suffering, death and resurrection. There is significance to bread and wine, symbolic significance. It's a bread of liberation and it's the cup the, the wine of covenant. And that again comes out of a Jewish, very long Jewish tradition. So where the church rejects the dietary laws and prescriptions, for instance, she carries on many of the Jewish traditions. The use of wine in religious ceremonies is regarded as acceptable by certain groups, including Eastern Orthodox Christians and certain Protestant denominations. Mormons, however, specifically forbid wine or any alcoholic drinks because of their stimulant properties. The Anglican Church does not have any dietary requirements and members may choose to fast or abstain from certain foods during Lent and on Good Friday. To Muslims, eating is a matter of faith for those who follow the dietary laws called halal, a term for all permitted foods. There are many instances and places in the Holy Quran where the Almighty makes it clear that uh, together with eating pure and wholesome food known as halal, it must also lead to other specific and more important objectives. We would not like to say that halal is not an objective in itself, obviously it is. But for example, in chapter 2, verse 172, the Almighty says, 
كلوا من طيبات ما رزقناكم واشكروا لله eat halal pure and wholesome and be grateful to the almighty in the similar chapter verse 168 it says eat pure and wholesome and do not follow the footsteps of the devil in a more clear cut reference in chapter 23 verse 51 it is said kulu min tayyibat wa amalu saliha eat pure and wholesome and do righteous deeds all these three references are very clear that while eating pure and wholesome could be an objective and it is an objective in itself but together with that it also supposed to make us aware of other great objectives which the verses refer to as do not follow the footsteps of the devil uh, be grateful to the almighty follow it up with good deeds and if you look at those references the message is very clear that together with eating that which is pure and wholesome your entire life your behavior your conduct your character your interpersonal relationship should also be pure and wholesome in islam prohibited food is known as haram it is believed that the creator turns a deaf ear to a muslim who eats haram that are forbidden in the quran one of the regulatory bodies who ensure that only halal manufactured or processed foods reach the Muslim consumer is Sanha, the South African National Halal Authority. For Muslims, adherence to Islam is not specific to rituals of worship. Uh, it embodies and encompasses every facet of the person's life. So from the time the child is born right up until the time that you lower it into your grave, every aspect of your life is governed by, by Islamic law and uh, consumption is intrinsic to the sustenance of life and therefore uh, Muslims understand and believe that uh, non-halal consumption or consumption that is not in accordance with Islamic dictates not only affects your physical constitution but also severely impacts on your spirituality and therefore you would find uh, almost all Muslims even though they may not be very very strong Muslims in terms of practice but you wouldn't find them just going and eating any and everything that may be unlawful. Established 15 years ago, Sanha as a halal regulatory and certifying body operates as a non-profit entity and applies the highest Sharia or Islamic law standards in its practices. Sanha certifies over 1,400 establishments ranging from large multinationals to many proudly South African enterprises including cottage industries. Generally, there is a misconception that halal is uh, specific to uh, slaughter and to meat products. But halal is a, a word that encompasses all consumption. So anything that you eat, uh, whether it be meat, whether it be bakery, whether it be confectionery, all these various categories are governed uh, by the injunctions of halal uh, and the dietary laws relating thereto. Uh, broadly, uh, if it is uh, animals, then it must be from those animals that are permitted species. Not all species are permitted. Your, uh, your cattle, uh, your lamb, your sheep, your camels, your poultry, ostrich, fish, these are all permitted species. Species not permitted are your pork, all carn carnivorous animals, uh, your reptiles, uh, donkeys, mules, uh, not permitted either. Uh, and also carnivorous birds are not permitted. Uh, game, venison is permissible. Uh, obviously when it comes to animals then they have to be slaughtered in accordance with the prescribed procedures outlined by Islamic law. Halal certification or regulation of the food, in, food industry in, uh, in South Africa has been something uh, that has been uh, upheld for decades. Uh, in fact uh, you know, the Jamiatul Ulama, the Muslim Judicial Council, these bodies go back as to 1923, 1940s. And uh, from their very inception, in their own little way, they, they assisted the community in terms of guidance and directive for halal food. So the need for halal certification, uh, what it was 40 years ago, uh, probably was insignificant to the importance and the need that exists today and growing. Uh, if we take the meat industry, it's evolved tremendously. If we take the products that are made from just that one lamb carcass in terms of value-added products, also tremendous improvement and extension 
over the over the decades. So yes, the need for halal certification, not only within South Africa, but in the global context, uh, is apparent. One of the primary production and processing sites where halal implementation and compliance starts is at various abattoirs around the country. At a halal certified abattoir like Karen Beef, Sanha ensures that there are dedicated halal supervisors and slaughterers on site to ensure compliance and non-contamination. With an abattoir like Karen Beef, uh, when they apply for halal certification, uh, we send through to them the application forms, they send us the details of, of what it is they do, uh, the type of products uh, they manufacture, or in an abattoir environment, how many animals they are slaughtering, um, how, how large is the abattoir, how many shifts do they have, do they have a single shift system, a double shift system, uh, do they do value added products as well, or, or is it simply uh, carcasses that they sell, do they, do they have a deboning area. These are the sort of questions we ask them at the initial stage in which they submit with the application. Uh, thereafter, once we receive the application, uh, a team of auditors will go through to the facility, do an inspection, uh, identify what the critical areas are in the facility, and what the requirements for the halal program will be. How many uh, halal supervisors would you require? How many halal uh, slaughterers would you require? Uh, what, uh, what are the time frames or the timelines in terms of the certification? Uh, how will the, the Sanha logo or the halal claims be used? All these different, uh, th these different issues will be looked at. And uh, once, once these have been identified, uh, a halal program uh, will, be, will be put in place. An agreement is signed between the parties and uh, thereafter certification is, is granted to the facility. Islamic law is very clear on the process of slaughter, placing great emphasis on compassion for animals that need to be considered when taking the life of the animal. This process, in essence, is what constitutes halal. Value-added products and the strict labeling thereof is also vital in the compliance chain. In terms of slaughter, firstly, the most fundamental aspect we spoke about is that the species must be a lawful species. And then the process of slaughter should be such uh, that uh, the animal is able to bleed well. And that is prescribed in terms of Islamic law as the jugular, the carotid, the esophagus and the trachea, there must be a horizontal cut across from the one ear to the other ear, severing these four uh, required vessels. Apart from the abattoirs, butchers and food manufacturers, food outlets and restaurants have to be halal certified to ensure that the needs of Muslim consumers are catered for. With a franchise outlet we first have uh, an association with the head office with the franchisor uh, whereby the franchisor makes application to Sanha for certification uh, they submit a list of all the ingredients all the suppliers for their different items we look at that list of suppliers uh, the list of ingredients that they use go through it make sure that all the suppliers to the uh, to the outlets in that chain are already certified or approved by Sanham. Once we've gone through that process and eliminated uh, whatever is not halal or uh, those products that are doubtful, we've ensured that, uh, that, that the suppliers have been changed to suppliers that are approved, uh, that are certified by Sanham. Uh, we then have an agreement in place with the head office whereby halal outlets are certified and regulated by us and once there is an, uh, a halal outlet that, wa that wants to open, they contact us, uh, we send through the application forms to them, they submit the details of the, uh, you know, of the establishment, we come through to the facility, do an, uh, do an inspection, ensure that all the requirements are being met and issue a certificate to that individual store. If one consumes halal, uh, then from a religious perspective, firstly you're, you're, you're subscribing to the law, divine law. That is the greatest wisdom behind it. In all acts of uh, worship, uh, the, the bottom underlying factor is, is sub submission to the will of God. And from a spiritual perspective and a philosophical perspective, uh, a person eats pure food, it would generate pure thoughts, it would generate righteous deeds and righteous action. If a person eats unlawful food, it will generate negative thoughts, negative action, and accordingly, uh, you know, the environment would, would be affected by uh, this type of, of, of negative behavior as well.
The Jewish dietary law is called kashrut, meaning proper or correct. The term kosher refers to the methods of processing foods according to the Jewish laws. Kashrut is a body of Jewish law dealing with what foods Jews can and cannot eat and how those foods must be prepared and eaten. The, uh, the term kosher is actually a very broad category. It refers to many detailed laws which appear in the Torah, in the Chumash, what we call in Hebrew, the five books of Moses, uh, different sections of it. So, for example, one dimension of the concept of kosher is there are certain categories of animals that are never kosher, famously pork. But there are others, uh, categories of animals that, uh, that can never be kosher no matter how they are prepared. Then, then you have um, uh, the, the methods of preparation of the animal and what, what's considered to be appropriate. Um, and so when we're talking about, um, for example, a cow or sheep, then there, there are ways of uh, ritual slaughter, uh, which our commentators explain is actually to find the most humane way of, uh, of killing the animal. Very interesting, there's a lot of recent scientific research that shows that the, the method of, uh, of, of the cut and the slaughter from a Jewish tradition point of view keeps the, the pain and the discomfort of an animal to the absolute, absolute minimum because it affects the, the, the feeling and the, um, the sensitivity within the animal and, uh, and, and there's a lot of scientific research on that which is, which is really fascinating. There, there are other categories of it when we're talking about fish and birds, there are different signs, for example, for fish to be kosher, there has to be a species which, a species which has both fins and scales. Different bird uh, categories um, are, are kosher and unkosher. The, the, the different categories which are mentioned in the five books of Moses. So, so that's all one dimension of kosher, which is which species of animals in the various types of animals are kosher and which are not. The processing laws and other restrictions regarding the preparation of food and drink were mainly devised for their effects on health. There is great emphasis placed on the non-mixing of certain foods. There are many rules of kashrut. Um, they would um, relate to fish and its derivatives, meat and its derivatives, meat and milk, which is a very big one. Uh, there are certain areas of Jewish law where you could have certain things which on their own are perfectly kosher, but when you put them together, the resultant mixture is not kosher. And, and that's uh, specifically relating to meat and milk. So you could have a perfectly kosher piece of meat and a perfectly kosher glass of milk or piece of cheese or something containing dairy, and that's fine. But when you mix the two together, the resultant mixture is 100% non-kosher. And so you'll find in your average Jewish kosher home, uh, everything is completely separate. Separate plates, knives, forks, ovens, pots, pans for everything containing meat and its derivatives and the same separate everything for, uh, for milk and its derivatives. Uh, a kosher restaurant or a kosher establishment will be classified as either being meat or dairy. You'll never have both. So a cheeseburger is just totally not an option. Um, even after eating meat or products containing meat, we wait a certain amount of time before we eat something containing milk or something uh, which is milk. So you can't even have a cup of tea with milk immediately after having a steak. You would have to wait a number of hours. All Jewish food manufacturers, restaurants and franchises have to observe and comply with the laws of kashrut for their establishments and products to be certified kosher. This certification supervision and monitoring process is managed by the kosher department of the Beth Dean or Jewish Ecclesiastical Court. Here at the office we, we have the, the central administration. Uh, what you won't see in the office are the uh, rabbis and the inspectors that are out at the factories doing their inspections, sending in their reports. Uh, I have a rabbi currently in Mauritius. I've got them all over the country. Uh, here we have some of the administrative team. We've got uh, on the technical side a food technologist and a pharmacist who analyzes products on paper technically. Uh, it's no good going out to do an inspection if at least on paper the product isn't okay. So we do the technical analysis here. So there's a lot of administration that goes on here, a lot of paperwork, a lot of uh, phone calls. Also, this is the, the actual uh, call center. So when the community calls in to ask if a product is or isn't kosher, uh, those calls would generally come through here. Food manufacturers and restaurants are stringently supervised and monitored by designated kashrut inspectors who are appointed by the Beth Dean's kosher department. Their duties are to ensure that kosher compliance is maintained and that the final product is fit for Jewish consumption. 
everything that comes in must be kosher authorized. So it comes in with, 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 with our seal or seals of one of uh, the, 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 I suppose, about 160 kosher organizations all over the world. So we check to see that it's on, on, the, on the food and to see that all procedures are followed. Obviously, uh, meat and milk have to, be, have to be separate. When it comes to Passover, no flour, leaven or anything like that. This has to be completely separated and uh, all other procedures are followed. Kosher seals and labeling are important in ensuring that the consumer is confident that they are eating food which is in accordance to Kashrut law. Either the, the actual food is sealed up with our tape or we put on the fridges, every single fridge that, that contains meat or, 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 or unsealed food, we put these number seals on them and those are recorded in the, the log books. So in other words, if, the, if, if, if tomorrow another supervisor will come, straight away when he breaks a seal, he will see in the logbook those seal numbers. Owners of Jewish food establishments have to ensure that they adhere to all elements of kosher certification and that food is produced and delivered on time. Our operation opens its doors at approximately 7 a.m. in the morning and what we do is we uh, dispatch all our meals that are for that day to all our clients. At 8 o'clock our mashkiach arrives on site, he then breaks all the seals of our fridges and then uh, switches on all machinery, make sure that everything is 100%. During the course of the day he will make sure that all our leaf vegetables, eggs, flour are sifted, broken, checked for kashrut. Um, he will then also during that time assist in the meat kitchen whenever they need the oven doors closed to make sure that all the rules of kashrut are maintained to the highest level. By about 12 o'clock we get ready to finalize all the packaging for the day and then we dispatch all the hospital meals and airline meals fresh on that day for the day. Every company wants a kosher certificate. It's this which tells the company and the consumer that the product is kosher. So for example, uh, it will have the logo which is the internationally recognized diamond logo. Uh, it has a, a date and a very unique certificate number. No two certificates are the same. It's almost like a fingerprint, which helps with, uh, with identifying forgeries and that kind of thing, which unfortunately sometimes does happen. Uh, it will list the name of the company. It will list the address of the company where the factory is, because obviously the products are certified specific to that factory. It will list the products. If there's more than one, this particular one has only one. So here we have baby marrow mayonnaise salad. That's a specific product for this company. Uh, and then it's got a number of unique codes. The P, uh, it means that the product is parav in that it doesn't contain any meat or any dairy that, that has very uh, specific significance in Jewish law. NP means it's not for Passover. As I said, Passover comes with its own specific uh, dietary requirements. The letters BD means that the retail product must carry the Beth Din logo on the actual labeling. And then we've given it a category of salad. And uh, on, the basis of, on the basis of this certificate, the company can then market that product as kosher to the community. On a much deeper level, these laws of what we may or may not eat correspond to a spiritual universe. That's part of what our commentators teach us and that in the same way there are certain laws of the physical universe that we have to correspond to and, and uh, be in sync with. Like laws of physical health, they're also laws of spiritual health and this is part, these laws of what we may or may not eat are part of a reflection of spiritual laws of the universe as created by God and so to the laws of kosher. It's part of a broader philosophy of Judaism which says we engage with the physical world. This is the arena where we serve God and we need to uplift the physical world in which we live. Hindus do not consume any foods that might slow down spiritual or physical growth. Hindus are usually vegetarian, avoiding food that may have caused pain to animals in the manufacturing process. This philosophy stems from the teachings in ancient Hindu scriptures and practices. We will go firstly to the primary scriptures of uh, Sanatan Dharma or the Hindu Dharma, which is the Rig Veda. And in the Rig Veda, an appeal is made by the devotee uh, to the supreme power to protect both the two-legged as well as the four-legged creatures. And the appeal goes further to say that uh, they should grow in stature as well as in strength together. And that no hurt or harm should occur to either the two-legged or the four-legged creatures whatsoever. 
and then you'll find further into the Rig Veda that those people who eat the flesh of humans or who slaughter uh, horses and cows uh, should be actually discouraged from engaging in this activity. Then you'll find further in uh, Hindu history, <coughs> if one looks at the Manu Smriti, herein it is said that one should not eat the meat or the flesh of another creature because uh, the eating of such a meat will keep one fixed in karmic bondage. In other words, as you sow, so shall you reap. And we see from the scriptures that the consequences of meat eating is actually uh, has a negative impact on people. The Tirukural, which is a very widely read uh, 2000 year old uh, scripture on ethics, also speaks to the conscience and it says that when one realizes that uh, he or she is eating the meat uh, of another creature, then he should immediately cease in such activity. So again, you can see that uh, not only is a call being made for people to uh, lead a vegetarian life, but also to, to take care of as well as to protect uh, animals. By following the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, Hindus come to realize that animals are believed to have spiritual awareness. Therefore, eating meat is believed to accumulate the animal's karma, which must then be balanced by good deeds to lead one into the next life. The Bhagavad Gita also uh, makes an appeal uh, for people not to engage in meat eating, whether it be for religious purposes or any other. In chapter 16, Bhagwan Sri Krishna says uh, to the devotee or to his devotee Arjun, which in fact, in effect, is to the rest of the world. Uh, he says that those people who engage, or the, rather non-injury and non-violence and truthfulness are the qualities of a human being who is endowed with divine nature. And so uh, the appeal therefore is being made that one should not engage in what is called himsa or violence, but we should practice ahimsa which is non-violence. The concept of Ahimsa extends into the lives of many individuals, especially Hindus. In a Hindu home, the way of life and observing a strictly vegetarian lifestyle is all-encompassing. There are codes of ethics to be followed before food takes priority in one's life. In Hinduism, we have different philosophies, different sects. Now we in this home follow the Vaishnavism sect, wherein it is required that we observe four regulative principles. The first principle is no illicit sex life. Secondly, no gambling, no intoxication. And the last one is to observe a vegetarian diet. So that is why we have this, uh, that we are actually uh, following a vegetarian diet. There is an array of dishes and recipes for vegetarian Hindus to follow, and much of it relies and depends on one's creativity and willingness to experiment with their vegetables in the kitchen. But you can take a simple thing like a brinjal and transform it, and it becomes such a lovely dish to eat. And then there are so many different dishes like where we use stuffed vegetables, puris, rotis, lagans, and it's just that you need to get out there and to find the time and to prepare it. And since we are vegetarians, we are very, very uh, careful about what we eat on the outside because we have to worry about what ingredients have been used in the foods. And uh, it is uh, said that the consciousness of the person out there who prepares the food has an effect on people who are especially on the spiritual path. The South African Hindu Mahasabha is a body that promotes and upkeeps Hindu values and principles. Due to various concerns from Hindu consumers about the authenticity and verification of strictly vegetarian products, the Mahasabha introduced the Shuda logo for certification of vegetarian consumables. Shuda in Sanskrit means pure, and the lotus flower signifies purity. 
the, hence the Shudao logo was created with the lotus flower. And this, has, uh, this logo has, is a registered trademark of the South African Hindu Mahasabha in about March 2003. By buying any food item that carries the South African Hindu Mahasabha Shuddha logo, vegetarians are reassured that there is no contamination of animal, fish or insect products. For certification, uh, the manufacturer does the necessary application and Together with this application, we request that he sends us a, a, a list of all his ingredients, the composition of the ingredients, the labels that he's going to use, his um, uh, packaging material, and all sorts of ad advertisements. So that we can, then we, we send these uh, specifications to the, uh, we have the services of the uh, food technology department uh, uh, from of uh, Durban uh, University of Technology. They are assisting us to, uh, to certify these products. The Mahasabha then regularly inspects production plants and food manufacturers to ensure that there is no contamination with any fish, insects and animal products during the processing and final packaging. The International Society for Krishna Consciousness, or ISKCON, places emphasis on a vegetarian diet and on offering food to the Lord before consuming it. This lifestyle is based on the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings and practices of respected Swamis which is all aimed at spiritual awareness. There's a benefit if by taking prasadam, food offered to the Lord, is that you develop a spiritual body. This body is going to die anyway. Either today, tomorrow, whenever it's going to die, it will die sooner or later, according to our karma, our, our reactions. Some creatures live for a few moments, some creatures live for years. The maximum we live for 100 years, human beings. So the, the benefits of taking prasadam, food of, spiritual food, vegetarian food offered to the Lord, is that it's karma free. It's free of reactions, of killing. See, even if you kill a potato, even if you kill a cabbage, even if you kill a carrot, you have to take birth again in this material world. The soul has to again take birth, the karma is there. So we must have a karma-free diet. And then our sp senses become spiritualized, our tongue becomes spiritualized, our whole b life becomes spiritualized. So at the end of our life, we don't have to again to take birth in this material world. But we develop a spiritual body. So this chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare is a medicine and vegetarian food offered to God, offered to Krishna is the diet. So these two things are there, the medicine and the diet. Without, without the diet, the medicine won't work, you see what I mean? So just to be vegetarian is not enough. We recommend everyone, before eating their vegetarian food, they offer to God because He's given it you. you should, we should be grateful. Let him take first. Now let, you know, let, the, let God take first and we take his remnants. We become purified. This is, this is a Hare Krishna philosophy. Veganism is a type of vegetarian diet that excludes meat, eggs, dairy products and all other animal-derived ingredients. Many vegans also do not eat foods that are processed using animal products, such as refined white sugar and some wines. Ethical vegans reject the commodity status of animals and the use of animal products for any purpose, while dietary vegans or strict vegetarians eliminate them from their diet only. Um, the difference between vegetarianism and veganism is that a vegetarian um, doesn't eat meat, fish or eggs. But a vegan also includes dairy products, so they won't have cream, butter, milk or any animal products, even um, honey, because it comes from a bee. That's the difference between the two. Um, veganism originates through compassion to animals. 
there's no specific religious following, um, but you get vegans in all walks of life. And it's just people who have decided that they don't want to hurt other animals. It's out of compassion. And the way um, animals are farmed in this day and age is um, it's quite brutal, to be honest. Uh, mostly, not all of them. You still get the occasional cows on the pastures, but a lot of animals are, are factory farmed. They are pumped with hormones, um, antibiotics, and they don't, they're not living nice lives. And they're also beings which have a consciousness. They also do want to exist. And a vegan chooses and says, I don't want to take part in the, like, the bullying or the, of these other animals. Yeah. Vegans love food. It's not just about sacrificing oneself and saying, well, I'm not going to be eating. It's about cooking differently, doing things differently. There's a lot of research that goes into it initially because um, eating is a great passion, as much for a meat eater or a vegan. So um, there's two types of vegans. The one, like in anything, you can get a healthy person and an unhealthy person, whether they're a meat eater or a vegan or a vegetarian. Yeah? Um, what, what we try and do with veganism and vegetarianism vegetarianism is make it healthy as well. So we're looking at nutrition, um, healing with food, and typically a, a vegan in, enjoys food. I mean, we, you can have vegan hot chocolate, you can make anything these days. There's so many recipes on the inter internet, it's endless. And you can live a perfectly health healthy life. I've been a, a vegan stroke vegetarian because I do sometimes have a little bit of honey for 10 years now, and I've been perfectly healthy. For my first seven years of vegetarianism, I wasn't sick once, but that's also because I eat healthy. I've studied nutrition, I've worked with a book um, on healing with whole food, and it's, um, it's a great lifestyle. The shifts that I've noted, noticed since I've been vegetarian is um, a shift in awareness. Um, after eating, I don't get tired, and I just, generally feel more aware and more energetic, um, which I really enjoy. In Hinduism, there's the gunas. The gunas is rajas, tamas, and sattvas. The one means tamas, which is inertia or ignorance. Rajas is passion and desire. And sattva is purity. Now, these things exist in all of us and in all elements in different ways and forms and in different degrees. Um, the way we try and cook at the Greenside Cafe is we try and create a sattvic diet. A sattvic diet is pure, it's clean, it's good for meditation, contemplation, for linking up mind, body and spirit. Another form, environmental veganism, rejects the use of animal products on the premise that the industrial practice is environmentally damaging and unsustainable. Rastafari is a religion that is centered around the idea that the Messiah is Haile Selassie, the last emperor of Ethiopia. For Rastafari, it is important to live simply, away from influences of others, especially foreign cultures. This is what drew many to the Rasta way of life. When I saw the Rastas, there was this a certain feeling I would get and I liked it, you know. So I, you know, naturally I was curious, so I started, you know, investigating and then, yeah, I think I found myself. And I also learned that I'm not separate from my creator. We are one. He is, he is my breath, you know, because Genesis 1 says that, you know, he created us and he gave breath. So my belief is that every one of us is a piece of God's bread. Rastafari derive their beliefs and morality from intense personal meditations and prayer. And therefore, there is no single dogma of Rastafarian belief. Going back to the concept of oneness, you know, we, we have a perception that, uh, you know, my physical self is separate from my emotional self, from my spiritual self, but it's it's all one package you know and whatever you put into your body will obviously affect those other aspects as well so it is important for us to to be aware of the the types of food or drinks that we we put into our bodies because certain foods have certain effects you know on you so as rastafarians we know that we're not only supposed to be eating food just because it tastes good, you know. We eat because we want to nourish our bodies so that we can have sustained energy, so that we can live life fully. 
Rastas are permitted to eat any food that is ital food, meaning that it is cooked only slightly. Rastafari believe that this is the best way to keep the body pure and healthy. Ital means vital, so it means it's the food that is vital for your body. You know, the nutritious food, natural foods, not processed foods, animal products, and your, your salts, you know, we, we don't consume that because it's, it's unnatural. Yes. So it's food that derives from the soil. In Rastafari communities, it is often women who prepare food because their roles, in a similar manner to other societies, have traditionally been to take care of the homes and family. The kitchen is a sacred space um, because that's where I prepare the nourishment for my family. So it's very important for me as a Rasta woman to come into the space with a clean mind, with a clean heart, with a calm spirit. Because if I'm not in that space, the food will get affected automatically, you know. It's also important to make sure that you, you balance the food, you know, so that you don't just eat maybe pap and pasta and potatoes, because that's all starch. So you're not, even though you're eating foods from nature, but you, you are not balancing, you're not getting all the nutrients. So it's important to mix the colors. You know, some people always say you must check how, your, how colorful your plate is. So the more the color, the more nutritious it is. And then um, in terms of the health, um, research has been done and we know that it takes longer for the body to digest meat than it does for vegetables. The primary goal of adhering to an ITEL diet is to increase levity or the life energy that Rastas generally believe lives within all of us, as conferred from the Almighty. They believe that by adopting a vegetarian diet, you enhance levity rather than reduce it. The more people move towards a vegetarian lifestyle, the more we can also contribute you know, to the environment because uh, research has also shown that it actually takes more land, more water, more food to actually crop farm than it would just to farm vegetables. While the dietary practices of different religions vary and the rationale for each practice is based upon different texts, there's also much commonality when it comes to the physical and spiritual dimensions. Examining connections between food and religion helps to highlight how religion functions in cultures and why religious experiences are powerful for believers. It can also underline the fact that food feeds many hungers and that scripture provides structures that reveal the essence of the sacred through eating, sacrificing, preparing or serving food to believers, which all symbolically gives one a taste of heaven.